My name is Chaba Kessai, working from Ericsson, and today I will talk to you about uh, a solution we eventually deployed as Virtual BNG, which is the border network gateway where you get your IP address from the fixed network. Uh, and uh, this is the focus will be on software traffic management. So this is a so fully software solution on traffic management, and I won't really touch on how to make it into the hardware or use hardware APIs. So the, our agenda will look like this, that uh, first there will be a problem statement like thing that how, what is traffic management? It's, and this is not trivial, unfortunately, for a lot of people I talk to. Uh, then I will call out a set of limitations of the DPDK software traffic manager implementation, what, what we bumped into when we tried to deploy it in networks, essentially solid. And then I will also make a few performance and usable ticks, tricks at the end. So what is traffic management why do we need? In the figure you can see on the right hand side, this is a typical layer to access network. It's modeled like a tree topology, but in reality this is not a tree. And on the root of the tree we have this virtual or physical BNG, which is a box, that, or BRAS in other ways. This is what is authenticating the fixed subscribers. And uh, this is what is terminating the layer to encapsulation and also is doing uh, actually traffic management. Why this guy is doing traffic management? The reason is that uh, whatever bottlenecks we can have in the access network, those nodes most probably not programmed to handle subscriber traffic, subscriber level queuing. So the, the solution is that eventually shape the traffic in the BNG on that way that it won't cause any congestion in the network, so there is no drops in the access network, no congestion, everything is under control. <clears throat> to achieve that, we have to model or mirror this thing on the, on the BNG node itself, so it's, it will be a tree topology, and this is where DPDK RT sketch comes into the picture. So starting from the far right side, I guess, yes, uh, the, we, we go with traffic class, uh, with queues, traffic classes. This is how we prioritize traffic for subscribers inside. Then on the layer two, or we call it level two, DPDK calls it pipe. These are the first token buckets there. Actually, we have to, token buckets of the traffic class as well, which we are doing some shaping. And then we have a hierarchy, so we have to mirror the network itself somehow. And uh, this is how, this is actually a hierarchical traffic scheme. And uh, this should be a, a mirror of the physical network. What's wrong with this? The very first problem what we bumped into is that in DPDK you have, you have to, you have to tell how many sub, sub ports the port will have. This is one intermediate hierarchy level and how many pipes, or the, uh, subscribers you have per port per support, okay, this is not good, okay. In reality, this is way more complex than that. We have requirements to change this on the fly without rebuilding the whole thing. And also, just a very simple thing that we have to support two levels of hierarchy at the, at the base thing. This is SVLAN, CVLAN. And it can be even more when we have L2TP and other tunneling stuff. So whatever has DPDK today, it's not enough for us. Solution is quite fairly simply make it dynamic on that way that uh, it's a kind of Link list, right? So we start from the users and uh, we have references to the, to the parents. So whatever was hard coded in DPDK originally, that having credit checks, credit updates in connection, when we go to the next user, we, we update the, the, the support, we'll do the same, but along with the link list. So it's that simple. So it fits into the chain, it fits into the pro processing budget for moderate level of levels. And uh, if you look into the new RTTM node add API, it has the same thing. It, does, it has a parent. And this is exactly that. Okay, the next thing is on them on queue allocations. So on this configuration example on the figure, you can see text like on demand, max. That means that uh, we have a theoretically possible setup which is not supported in, so we cannot, this, this actually will bring, it will allow for bring up 400,000 subscribers 
on the report. We don't support it, obviously, but uh, this is a requirement from operators that they don't really know how it will really look like. They want, they want one pre and pre one, one configuration. They don't want to change it box by box, and the actual VLANs, they will use it box by box, and this is the on-demand part. So that means that we cannot pre-allocate the whole thing in advance. So we have to make dynamically, and then what is the biggest memory user in a scheduler tree? The queuing, the queuing, the, the queuing errors. So one example, if you, have a, if you want to have 16, 256 packets long queue, then it's 32K per user. If you have to support 64K users on a box, this is two gigs of memory just for queuing errors. Pre-allocating something for 400,000.5. So the simplest thing is go and make the queuing errors dynamically allocated when it's really used. It's very simple, so go to the, to the pipe structure itself and you just have a reference of, of a queuing error which you allocate, deallocate when the pipe is bound or unbound. So in reality what will happen is that you just allocate the skeleton, so we allocate the token buckets for the hierarchical part of the network. We also allocate the traffic classes pipe token buckets and don't allocate the queues itself. We allocate them on demand. So in this figure, you can see that we have a lot of households eventually connected to the network, but not all of them are online for some reason. So all the guys who is not online or idle or something, we just release that piece of memory on the queue side and use it for something else. The next thing is an interesting requirement. And if you think of how the EPDK works, once you have a port and you have this, uh, so you, you turn on a TM engine on the port, everybody should have some traffic management policy. Everybody, whoever sends traffic over the port should have. We have a requirement that, okay, we have a set of users who don't have it. Maybe they are not paid, that they, they are low pay, some low-cost users or some other users, whatever. The requirement is that give the remaining bandwidth to those guys just the remaining bandwidth, so it's pretty much okay to starve them, but if there is empty resources in the network, give them to them. Obviously, this is not feasible with any kind of static configuration, so we have to go for an algorithmic change here. Actually, it's easy. We have uh, the single rate tricolor marker algorithm, which does exactly the same thing, that you have two token buckets, your refill rate is the, is the uh, you have one refill rate, and the yellow or exit bucket is something that you can use to feed somebody with tokens who are allowed to use just the remaining bandwidth. So that means that whoever have a real TM policy attached, so that's a guy who eventually pays for the service, pays for a hungry mag or something, that traffic, let's mark that traffic green. So that will go from the conform bucket all over, all over this, uh, uh, in the tree, in their, in their uh, route, and only the spillover credits will go to the exit bucket, and the guys without this can use just the exit bucket. This makes, this ensures that only remaining bandwidth is given to the, we call them default pipes or default users. These are the default users who don't have a really configured policy. And uh, it's easy, on the support level, we just have to have multi more, more, more token buckets, that's it, so it's a few bytes only. The next and more interesting thing is over subscription. So in fixed networks, the operators are Oversell. So they have a physical network. In this, this is a this is a stupid example. It's not uh, not real, but uh, just to show you that the operator pretty much can have a hundred max link, and might connect two households or three households with hundred mig gig hundred mag max in the subscription. You will have the bottom line. That's the small letters. That okay. You have 100 mags, this is the max, so you're guaranteed is one mag. Well, that means that you have a one to 100 over subscription ratio in the network. Just check your contracts. You will see that. This is pretty much typical in fixed network. So we have an over subscription situation and we have to handle it. If we go with the stock DPDK support level scheduling implementation, whatever is there, 
it's not fair. So what's going on is that you have a fixed traversal order. We also, you also have a first come first served uh, algorithm to serve on the support level. So it's pretty much possible the first guy gets all the credits, the second guy never get it. It can, it can end up in some, some, probable, uh, some uh, deterministic scenario at the end. So nothing guarantees fairness, nothing guarantees any way to configure weights, and this is for the basic implementation there. However, it has something. So it has the TC3 over subscription, not enabled by default, and this is what inspired me to go and think a bit more and uh, try to use it. So what I choose on here, it also has a name, even an RFC. This is 2698. This is two color, three, no, dual three color marker. So that means that we have two rates and two token buckets and uh, well, three colors, which means the third color is that no, but you do not fit to any of the buckets. So you have a peak information rate. This is our old token bucket rate. So this is your marks rate. This is what is on your construct. This is the marketing speed. And you have another token bucket refilled with another rate which is scaled back dynamically. So we detect the bottlenecks in the network. It should be just one bottleneck on the, on the path, and we scale down the entire subtree. Now these mean rates or CIRs or guaranteed rates or whatever, it's, it's called guaranteed rates in some cases. Unfortunately, it's not guaranteed at all. The only thing it is, it is a weight. So if somebody have a higher CIR than the other, then it will get a higher share from the actual bandwidth, whatever is really available in the system. Uh, we have to build a control loop for that. It's, it's easy. So we have a fixed traversal order. So we always know when we, when we served all, all of our users. So we can make the changes in connect af after this whole run. So this whole thing will be fair on one hand. And on the other hand, since it's a control loop, there will be some inaccuracies. There could be some overshooting, which is a bigger problem, or there, should be, there could be some unused bandwidth during this uh, adaptation rounds. Now, this unused bandwidth is not lost. So this unused bandwidth is still available as access bandwidth, or yellow packets, or whatever. So the users or default guys can use it. And one more interesting thing is that you can, we can use this to implement this default pipe function. So the guys without any, so the, non, the guys who are not paying for the service, for example, just put this CIR to zero, which means that they have no guaranteed bandwidth at all. So whenever there's a congestion, they, they, go, they, go, they go with zero odds. They have no, no, no chance to get, get any share, but if there is any free resources in the network, they can get it. This is exactly what the requirement. Okay, then, few speed up tricks, um, integer divisions. So if we, if we go and check a path of what's going on, an integer division is expensive. And we have a lot of them in connection with credit updates. And there is also a commit to the scheduler which is switching the, the floating point division to, to a way to approximate a division. This is what I've over, mo simplified more. This is just a shift and multiply. So we can actually abstract the division by shift and multiply. The cost is a granularity. And, but our requirements were something like 1% accuracy, so that works. Um, so how it works that we, instead of dividing, we just shift down and multiply and keep the reminder. That is a, some, some code snippets, how to do that. And the other thing is that you have this so-called TC period in the API for the traffic class side. Ah, that's not intuitive, guys. So um, nobody really knows what to set there. So this is some update interval, but you have a single one and you for the, all of your traffic classes. So take 40 milliseconds. Um, the minimum bandwidth you can express in that way is 300 kilobits. Otherwise, uh, 1,500 bytes long packet will never fit into the system because this will be your burst size, 1500. On the other hand, if you want to express a one gig rate with this update interval, then you have to 
keep up a five megabytes buffer per user, uh, sorry, per queue. That's not realistic again. So we have to release this thing and we have to go and have a master rate per user and then uh, say have a master rate per pipe. This is what we keep up. This is where we keep the, the last update time and then express the rest under this hierarchy as a fraction of this master rate. So this is again a kind of division, but it's not division, it's a, it's a shift and, and multiplication and also keeping the reminder. So it's very nicely fits into the implementation. And also it saves a few bytes, which is not a bad thing. So honestly, we have to support 16K, 64K of these things and it has to also fit into cache line, one cache line, two cache line, actually it fits two cache line, you know, implementation at the end. So it, a few bytes make counts, yeah, that's it. And for the, finally, this is our mapping. So what you have, what you can see here is a configuration example. This is a real configuration example from the Ericsson VBNG or original BNG product. This is how a PWFQ policy is configured. And this is the configuration what we use. This is the exact same configuration what we use on a real hardware with, with, the, with an ASIC-based TM implementation or multiple ASIC-based, we have multiple ASIC, so we have different TM, hardware and TM implementations. So the look and feel of the thing must be the same. And uh, this is just to map things. So who, I don't know who is, uh, whoever, familiar with the actual DPDK TM implementation. This figure should be familiar for those guys. What we have here, it's very simple. So we have a rate maximum. This is the per user policy. So this is your, it's like a hundred, yes, it's a hundred megabits. At the moment, this is your subscription and this is your pipe, this is your pipe PIR rate. Then your rate minimum is your weight, which is your pipe CIR rate. Then we provide priority group functionalities. We, we, call, we call priority group what is called in DPDK traffic classes. We have also mapping, also the WIR weights, and basically that's all. We can, okay, we can have traffic class rates, which is a fraction. You see it's a percentage of the, of the root rate. So that's all, thank you guys. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. We may take questions maybe um, yes. because we're just going right into a break now, but thanks very much for that. And okay. I'll, I'll actually talk to you afterwards because okay. I have a question. So yeah, thanks very much, Java.